for your kind uh, introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope that uh, you've had your coffee and you're coming back refreshed, ready to learn about how to drink coffee properly and not aspirate. Good. So, the, uh, the, the, this, the purpose of my discussion today will go over the incidence and burden of aspiration pneumonia, but mainly in the elderly. So I will not be discussing this uh, problem in children, the etiology, the assessment, and the management briefly. So aspiration is defined as a misdirection of gastric contents or oropharyngeal substances into the larynx and then to the lower respiratory tract where they could lead to pneumonia. Now, aspiration of pathogens from a previously colonized oropharynx is the primary pathway by which bacteria enter the lung. And this is not only in the elderly. This is, of course, in all, uh, most of our community acquired pneumonia patients. Of course, there are other ways of entering the lungs, but this is a main way of entering the lower tracts. Indeed, the most common pathogens, Haemophilus and Streptococcus pneumoniae, first start by colonizing the nasopharynx before they end up aspirating and causing community-acquired pneumonia, and this has been known for now quite a while. When we do use aspiration pneumonia, we refer to the fact that we have developed a pneumonia in the setting of a patient who has risk factors for increased oropharyngeal aspiration. So this is how, what, we, what was coined as aspiration pneumonia. Now, this disease is certainly quite important. It has a huge burden, especially in the elderly, as community-acquired pneumonia is the major cause of morbidity and mortality in the elderly, with a cost that goes well beyond $4 billion in the States. And this is kind of old study as well. This is from 98, and I am sure that the cost has escalated as the population is growing older and as uh, we are, uh, you know, the cost is actually climbing from 98. It is actually the leading cause of death. Residents of nursing homes often end up dying because of a pneumonia. And as you get older, your risk of pneumonia grows. It is six times higher if you're older than 75 than if you are younger than 60. So clearly, a quite an important uh, disease process we have to deal with. And this incidence is also highest in nursing home residents, where it is 33 per 1,000 cases per year, per 1,000 home residents per year, who end up being hospitalized for pneumonia, as compared to age-matched elderly living in their own home or in their community, it's only one case per 1,000. So it is 33 times more frequent if you are in a nursing home uh, environment. Obviously, we will discuss why later. So what is the cause of aspiration pneumonia? Actually, we know that healthy adults, us, we do aspirate small amounts of oropharyngeal secretions as we sleep, and this without any sequelae. Why is that? It's mainly because we have a much lower virulent bacterial burden in our oropharyngeal secretions, because we have a very healthy cough. As anything goes in, it is coughed out immediately. We have an active ciliary transport that brings up all those bacterias, and we have a normal immune system, so we can fight off the, 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 the nidus that is going to start an infection very rapidly before it does, does anything. Now, the, aspiration, the etiology of aspiration pneumonia is really multifactorial, but mainly, mainly, it is dysphagia that leads to aspiration pneumonia. And we will discuss this a bit more. So, we know, for example, Loeb studied a while back the relationship between difficulty swallowing food and the development of pneumonia, and he found it to increase the risk by twice, an odd ratio of two. And if those elderly had problem taking their medication, 
I am sure Leslie will discuss with us these things. That's an indicator of a bigger problem with swallowing. Then the odd ratio becomes eight. So they are eight times more, uh, 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 more uh, uh, likely to develop pneumonia. And if you do witness aspiration, many times we just ask the family or the, the, the caretaker, did you, did you notice that your loved one is actually aspirating or uh, while eating? That is actually a very important indicator. And if those patients are just taking sedatives, and we all know that many of them do take sedatives for many different reasons. They have dementing processes, they could be depressed, they could have problems sleeping. So if they are taking sedatives, even if they don't have any other problems, this is a very important risk factor for pneumonia in nursing homes. There is something we call silent aspiration. Silent aspiration, otherwise healthy elderly with community-acquired pneumonia, was demonstrated by indium chloride scanning in 71%. That means if you are an elderly that has developed CAP at some point during your, uh, your, your recent past, then you will have quote-unquote silent aspiration, aspiration not leading to pneumonia, as demonstrated by your indium scanning uh, uh, in 71% of the cases, as opposed to only 10% in age-matched control subjects. So they do aspirate, and they aspirate frequently. Also, not only dysphagia is a problem, elderly patients with pneumonia are quite commonly found to have a markedly depressed cough reflex. And the greater this derangement, the greater the risk of pneumonia. They did measure swallowing and cough in healthy elderly, in elderly with dementia, and in elderly with no prior history of pneumonia. Uh, sorry, uh, elderly with dementia, but no history of pneumonia, and elderly with aspiration pneumonia. So three groups. How they did it? They, have, they put in a very thin tube through the nose and drip some water and time how long it takes them to start swallowing. And they found it to be 1.2 seconds in the control subjects that are not demented and don't have aspiration pneumonia. It is 5.2 seconds if you have pneumonia, even if you have never aspirated. And if you did have aspiration pneumonia, then it is delayed up to 12 seconds. So almost 10 times to 12 times more. And they also studied cough in a very nice way. They got people to inhale citric acid. They noticed that the control group needed only 2.6 milligrams per millimeter of citric acid to start coughing, when the people that had dementia needed 37 milligrams, and those that had aspiration pneumonia needed 360 milligrams of citric acid per ml to start coughing. I am sure that all of you noticed this. We commonly, as chest physicians, get people into the intensive care setting on the wards with aspiration pneumonia. And you have to sometimes go do a bronchoscopy. I noticed that I can get in without instilling any lidocaine. My patient doesn't cough, although he has a bronchoscope in his airways. That is a very poor indicator, very poor. Whatever goes in, he does not feel. He will keep it in. So. I'm sure Dr. Sawaya will touch on this with more details, but the incidence of cerebrovascular and degenerative neurology diseases increases clearly with age, and these disorders are clearly associated with problems swallowing and coughing. And these will, of course, have an increased risk of aspiration. For example, a patient that has an acute stroke will have an incidence of dysphagia that ranges from 40 to 70%, of course, following this, uh, depending on the severity of his stroke. And this incidence will improve, of course, but will still fluctuate up to one third of the patients will still have some dysphagia a while back after their stroke. And aspiration occurs in almost half of stroke patients that have dysphagia. So here we are with, left with almost 15% of your initial patient with stroke that will end up having dysphagia and aspirating. Patients with Alzheimer's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and Parkinson's, all common 
uh, uh, neurologic processes in the elderly also develop dysphagia early in the course of their diseases. I have a patient who's completely awake. I have just discharged him today. And he has a problem talking because of his Parkinson, and he aspirates big time. Big time. And it's a problem. It's a problem because uh, he's difficult to, to, to manage. Leslie dealt with him. And he's completely awake. And we're discussing with him, placing a peg, and no longer giving him food through the mouth. Very difficult problem. So Parkinson has affected his swallowing greatly, but not his level of alertness. He's still very well awake. And that's depressing to him. Now, the severity of dysphagia does not necessarily relate to the overall severity, and I just mentioned to you the example of my patients. Now, there are other factors that increase the risk. It's not only dysphagia and cough. It is how much you aspirate, the volume, okay? And what are you colonized with? As you know, the elderly will have an increased colonization of Staph aureus and also aerobic gram-negative, gram like Klebsiella and E. coli. So it's not only the anaerobes, okay? There's a significant number of gram-negative bacilli and staph aureus. We have to think of that when we are choosing our antibiotics. Now, th there are also weak, elderly have a weak host system, I mean, uh, defense. They have poor oral hygiene, and they do not swallow their saliva properly. Now, this is interesting. I'm sure many of you know that. If you do not have any teeth, then you have a lower risk of aspiration than if you do have some and uh, their hygiene is poor. And if you do have a problem with your oral hygiene, then you will see much more anaerobic uh, pathogens. And their immunity is certainly decreased. Why? Because their mucociliary transport is decreased. They have a decreased pulmonary elasticity, so they cannot cough as forcefully because of this reduced elasticity. Their muscle strength by itself is decreased, and their FRC is decreased. All of this will affect the way you clear the secretions from the lung. Not only that, with time, we all know that the immune system ages, mainly seen in the peripheral T cells. There is also a decreased activation of those immune cells when they are challenged with antigens. So the immune system is becoming dull. Not only that, they are quite commonly poorly fed. They have a poor nutritional status. They're old, they have dementia, and they are unable to eat properly. They ha it takes them much longer to go through the same meal. They end up being extremely cachectic. And that does affect the immune system, as measuring serum albumin by itself is an independent risk factor for CAP in the, in the elderly. So how do we assess dysphagia? I'm going to touch on this rapidly. I say that the clinical assessment is quite important. Taking a good history, as I have mentioned, is your patient on sedatives? Does he aspirate when he eats? Motor and sensory evaluation will be discussed in details. We have to also evaluate his oral control, his lingual activity, oral residues, laryngeal elevation, laryngeal excursion, voice quality, cough. Leslie will discuss that in detail. We have to also, we could auscultate the neck as the patient is swallowing, putting a pulse oximeter on his finger, and something we commonly use, give him a colored food like jello in a tracheostomized patient and go aspirate the trachea and see if we find anything within the trachea. If we do all of this, then we have a, we're doing quite well. We are quite accurate with an 80% sensitivity and a 70% specificity for diagnosing it. But there are also other ways to assess it that could be quote unquote called objective. The video fluoroscopic swallow assessment is quite commonly used and will identify clearly aspiration. Fiber optic endoscopy looking at the vocal cords, at the anatomy at, as the patient is swallowing is also quite helpful. We can also use scintigraphy, ultrasonography, etc. How do we manage elderly with dysphagia? Of course, we give them antibiotic when they have the pneumonia, and that is not the purpose of this discussion. It, the, the management of dysphagia is clearly a coordinated effort by different professionals, and it is challenging many times because of the disease process. We should collaborate as chest physicians with a speech therapist, and we do. It should be done, and it should be emphasized. The dietitian should know how to prepare the meal in such ways it leads to less aspiration. The nurse that gives the meal 
Oral hygienist should look at the teeth, make sure they're okay, along with the dentist, as well as the primary caregiver, because many times those patients are under the care of their geri the geriatric physician or their internist, etc. The goal is really to optimize safety. Make sure they do not, this does not happen again. But also, we have to make sure that they are efficient and effective at swallowing. This to maintain proper nutrition and proper hydration. As I've told you, elderly end up wasting because of this. And to, of course, improve oral hygiene. We can certainly modify the food and liquid consistency. There are uh, flu fluid thickeners that can give uh, more uh, body to the fluid they are trying to, to, to drink, as well as altering the bolus presentation. The consistency should certainly be individualized, but we have to be careful because many times we can fall into dehydration as we tell the patient, do not drink, because you will aspirate on water easier than you would aspirate on food. So we have to be very careful. We can use cold carbonated water because they feel it better. It is cold, and the bubbles in the carbonated water will help the patient feel the food as he can uh, swallow, uh, as he will swallow better. Okay, and we also use some compensatory strategies like postural maneuvers, Leslie will discuss it, indirect therapy, uh, exercise to strengthen swallowing uh, musculature. How about tube feeding? Commonly used by us. It could be required as we make every attempt to encourage oral intake within safe margins. But I want you to listen to this in end stage degenerative illnesses. It should be reconsidered, as there is no data to suggest that it prolongs survival, decreases aspiration pneumonia, decreases the, the risk of pressure sores, infections, improves function, or provides even palliation. So patients, if they are really at the end stage of their life, at least we don't have enough evidence to tell us that we are doing them any good by putting an NG tube over the long term. But short-term tube feeding is quite important and quite indicated to improve. While we are doing our, our thing, we are doing the therapy, we are improving swallowing, and the patient needs some nutrition for a while before he can get better. So that is certainly indicated. Now, I know that most of us will end up giving some form of enteral tube feeding to their patients as they become end stage. But just, you know, because, I mean, it's so difficult to tell the family, you know, I'm going to leave him without food or water. It's felt as if it is criminal, almost. But just think about the evidence I just showed you. And, you know, as your, maybe your patient would be, or the family would, would be ready to discuss such issues, and then they should really know that they are not doing the wrong thing. Now, um, Clearly, as your patient has an acute stroke, the incidence of pneumonia, aspiration pneumonia, if you feed them orally, is much higher than if you feed them by, by uh, NG tube. So the data I showed you before is for chronic end-stage illnesses, not for the acute illnesses as they are hopefully going to get better. So in conclusion, the impact of dysphagia is quite significant, often unrecognized, poorly diagnosed and managed in the elderly. Dysphagia is a major mechanism leading to aspiration pneumonia in the elderly and should be addressed properly. The diagnostic procedure and treatment options available should be increased upon, upon our medical profession. I, am no, I know that many of you have problems, for example, finding a good speech therapist to help you with, with the training. So I think that this, that this is very important. And with this, I would like to thank you.